Actually, yes, awesome. You guys are awesome. I'm so glad I'm not following the Bollywood guy. Um, but I can tell you seriously, all night I'll be practicing the sprinkler move. <laughs> right, left, right. So glad to be here. Um, last year, I was coming home from Asia. I was transiting through Los Angeles and had a little bit of a layover. So I walked outside the Tom Bradley International Terminal decided to go downtown. And I'd been through LAX many times, but I don't think I'd ever actually taken the bus from LAX to downtown. So I was jet lagged and just sat on a bench for a while, trying to figure out what to do. And this guy walks up. And this guy's like, sir, can I help you with directions? So I looked at him, and you know, he seemed friendly enough. He was holding a very official looking clipboard. And uh, I said, well, actually, I'm trying to go downtown. And he said, OK, no problem. Um, here's what you do. You take this bus. You know, then you transfer to this bus, and here's how much the fare is going to be. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And he said, no problem. While we're here, I'm working on behalf of disadvantaged children. Can I count on you for a donation? And the implied message, not spoken, but very much implied, was, hey, I just helped you with this thing. Surely you're going to help me, right? And so I gave him a few dollars so I wouldn't feel guilty. But then I felt bad the rest of the day. I felt taken advantage of. It was like you know, giving through guilt. And it reminded me of these organizations that you see sometimes on the streets of Portland or other cities who employ young people to kind of you know, promote their cause and harass people as they're walking by. And you, know, you're, you always try to kind of avoid them, but it's very difficult. So you're just walking along, and they're so friendly. They're like, hi, nice shirt. You look like someone who cares about the endangered vegan earthworm. <laughs> and you're just standing there, and you're like, you look like someone who cares about getting my money. <laughs> and the only reason you want to shake my hand is because research shows if we physically touch, then I'm going to be more sympathetic to your cause. So it's also kind of false and kind of manipulative. And I was thinking about this, I was reminded of both of these things, while um, I was working hard watching Hulu this week. And uh, Hulu was kind enough to show me some nice advertisements from a great oil company. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been working hard with Hulu yourself and seen some of these ads. But if you haven't, um, the core message in these ads is, oil companies are people too. And so there's all these pictures of happy children playing in fields, and the narrator's like, here at Chevron, we're working on behalf of a sustainable future with renewable energy for everyone. And I'm just watching this with incredulity, and I'm thinking, does anyone believe this? I mean, I don't hate corporations. I don't think they're all evil. But you know, if you're asking me to believe that the oil company, whose very business is based on a lack of sustainability, whose very profit is based on scarce resources, you know, is really motivated and incentivized to create renewable energy and a sustainable future for everyone, I'm not sure I believe that. And in fact, I'm a little bit cynical. And so the problem with these kind of messages, whether it's from an oil company, whether it's from a well-meaning organization that's probably doing great work when they're not harassing people on the street. The problem is that this is false inspiration. It might cause us to feel something. It might cause us to take some kind of action. But it's going to be a net negative. And we're going to go away feeling bad. And it's going to be harder for us to believe the next time. And it's going to create cynicism. And the thing is, we don't want to be cynical. We want to believe. We want to be inspired. We want to care about the vegan earthworm. We don't want to give up. Imagine if the Mercy Corps guy had got up today and said, you know, I know we're all here to be inspired. We've got some really smart people working on our team. 
And we've been having some meetings, and we've come to the conclusion the world is just messed up. There's a lot of bad shit happening out there. We got earthquakes, tornadoes, civil war. And I know you're looking to us to give you some kind of answer, but we got nothing. So sorry about that. And the only thing to look forward to is happy hours in 20 minutes. <laughs> We'd be disappointed. We'd be upset. We'd be like, that's not fair. You can't give us a problem without giving us a chance to respond. It's OK if you don't have the whole answer. It's OK if you don't have the whole solution. In fact, maybe it's better if you don't have the whole solution. Maybe it's better if you say, you know, here are all these problems, and here's what we've got. But we need you. We need help. What have you got? How can you participate? How can you contribute? Because see, we want to be on a team. We want to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. Just think about when you go to a Timbers game or a Cavaliers game or any sporting events. And the audience in the stands assumes this collective identity with the players. And we assume this ownership. And the outcome of the game, even though it has nothing to do with us, all of a sudden we're very invested in it. And if our team loses, our life sucks. <laughs> and if our team wins, we're like, look what we did. Right? We, we may have been drinking beer and texting the whole game, but look, there's proof. There's the score. You know, we did this. Right? Now, the interesting thing is we want our team to win, but we don't necessarily want them to kick ass all the time. We want them to win, but we want them to work for it. We want them to struggle. We want it to be difficult sometimes. In fact, the ideal scenario is for our team to actually be down at the end of the game. It's been this close fight, and our team is down. It looks like we're going to lose. But all of a sudden, through this heroic effort, you know, we snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. And then we're like, look at that. Did you see that? We almost lost, but we won. Inspiration, genuinely, always has an element of risk. And it always has this possibility of failure. So every good reality show, not the ones where people are just fighting with each other, but the ones where someone's trying to accomplish something, someone's trying to, to do something, they understand this. They always frame the narrative around this question of risk and this possibility of failure. So they would never say, you know, James is going to swim for a little while, and he's going to climb this mountain. They'll say, James is going to attempt to forge the rapids. He's going to attempt to scale this mountain. Will he succeed? We don't know. Other people have tried and failed. Maybe James has tried before and failed. This is his final chance. That's what we want. We want the risk. We want the possibility of failure. And so inspiration always offers an invitation. And it always issues a challenge. The invitation is come and be a part of something bigger than yourself. Come and join the team. We need you. And the challenge is, this might not work out. This is going to be difficult. It's going to be risky. It might even be dangerous. But you know what? You don't want it to be easy. So as we're here to talk about inspiration and risk, I have two contentions for you this afternoon. And the first contention is that inspiration must create more than just wonderment. Inspiration must create action. Peter Drucker said, plans are merely ideas unless they immediately degenerate into hard work. And you could say the same thing for inspiration. You can say, uh, inspiration without action is merely entertainment. Inspiration without an act of transformation is just American Idol. And there's nothing wrong with entertainment, but it doesn't change us, it doesn't improve our lives or allow us to improve the lives around us. Now, it's good to say that the action that's derived from inspiration is not always directly related to it. So I can listen to Dee Williams, for example, and hear her story, and I might not move to a tiny house myself, but what if I start thinking differently about the things that I own 
and the items and the possessions that I choose to bring into my life. Think about how I value my money and my time. There's an act of transformation that occurs, so I would say that's genuine inspiration. And the second contention is that every significant accomplishment of ours, every challenge that we've overcome, every time we have been faced with some kind of dilemma and we've made the right choice, it can be traced to the positive action or the positive impact that someone had on our life at one point. And it could have been a long time ago, but we were inspired. It could have been years or decades ago. That person may not even realize it. They may have thought it was a small thing, but somehow you know, we were inspired and we've carried that with us and that affects us even today. So before I was a writer, I was a musician, and I thought I was awesome, like all musicians think. And uh, one time I was at a rehearsal with other musicians who actually were awesome. And I made the mistake of saying I was self-taught. And someone who is older and more experienced than me said, really, you were self-taught. You never listened to other musicians. No one ever showed you anything. You never like, you know, learned something and then adapted that in your own way. And so I got the idea. And I never said I was self-taught after that. And I realized that there's a difference between independent learning and being self-taught. Because you know, no one is really self-taught. And so we live in this beautiful age of scale and speed and connectivity. People are live tweeting here today. Other people are responding from all over the place. The other day I was walking through Pioneer Square. I heard a couple of homeless guys talking. And one of them is like, did you know that the iPhone is on Verizon now? <laughs> and the other guy is like, yeah, I know, but I got this AT&T contract for 18 more months. I'm like locked in. And I was like, you know, in some ways, it's very tempting to believe that the world is just, you know, getting smaller and smaller. Because for a lot of us, it is. And that's a beautiful thing. But meanwhile, there's still millions of people who lack access to clean water. There's still millions of people who don't have access to health care or primary education for their children. Millions of people all over the world who lack access to these basic opportunities and freedoms that we've been talking about. And so this strange, you know, new, beautiful world offers us opportunities. And it also offers us challenges. And so because inspiration must provide an invitation and a challenge, that invitation, that challenge that I'll leave you with today is the invitation to care and the challenge to believe. Sometimes, even in the spite of evidence to the contrary, when it would be so much easier to just be cynical and just not believe or just not care. Because caring is a very dangerous thing. When you choose to care, you open yourself up to being hurt. You could be wrong. You could believe in someone or something and then be let down by them. But if you choose to care, if you choose to believe, then and you're trying to figure out, you know, what do I do next and how do I focus and, you know, what's my thing to do? Then here are two questions. First question, what excites you? What gets you out of bed in the morning? And if the answer to that right now is school or a job, that's fine. But just think, if I didn't have to do that, if I didn't have an obligation, what would I get out of bed for in the morning? What would I really want to do? Steve Jobs said, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. I agree. But because time is limited, and because we've been given so much, I think it helps to think about another question. And this is the question, what bothers you? What bothers you about the world of all the problems out there, from earthquakes to earthworms and everything else, What's the thing that bothers you the most? What's the number one solution that you would like to have? And remember, it's OK if you don't have the solution. You just have to be willing to respond. You have to be willing to issue an invitation and a challenge. And you have to be willing to take the risk of caring. So I hope you'll do that. And what better place to do that than here in Portlandia?
Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. I'll see you at that happy hour.